hello, OT amplifiers, and welcome to this episode of the Amplify OT podcast. This episode is a little bit different because I am interviewing the individuals who are running for president-elect of AOTA and vice president of AOTA. These are elected board positions for AOTA, and elections are opening on February 2nd of 2024 and close on February 23rd of 2024. Because there were so many candidates and they had such fantastic things to say, we have actually broken up these interviews into three separate podcast episodes. Two episodes are dedicated to president-elect, and one episode is dedicated to the vice president. Now, I do want to make it super clear that there is absolutely no rhyme or reason as to why certain folks were grouped together or what order they appear in. I also want to make sure it's clear that I, myself, and Amplify OT are not endorsing any specific candidate. I think all of them have such an interesting perspective to bring to the position, and it's really going to be a tough choice. So I encourage you to listen to all the different interviews and hear the different perspectives, but also hear where they overlap in mission. For AOTA president-elect interviews, you will be hearing from Karen Sames, Michael Pizzi, Vikram Pagpatten, and Arame Amverzade. For vice president, you will hear from Natalie Chang-Wright and Christina Reyes. And I just want to say that I am so grateful that all of them agreed to participate in this project and that they are willing to put forward their time to support our profession for the better. There are numerous reasons to participate in this election, not only because we're voting for president-elect and the vice president, but there are also four individuals running for open positions on the board of directors. Now, unfortunately, many of these positions run unopposed. And while it's fantastic to see individuals who are getting involved and are willing to serve our profession, it's always great to have a choice. It's also unfortunate that for some positions, there were no nominations received, such as the Mental Health Special Interest Section Chairperson, the Home and Community Health Special Interest Section Chairperson, and the OTA Representative-Elect to the Representative Assembly. Unfortunately, there were no RA nominations received in Alabama, Connecticut, Georgia, Illinois, Kansas, Maryland, Montana, New Hampshire, North Dakota, Ohio, Oregon, Rhode Island, and Wisconsin. So if you live in any of those states and you're an AOTA member, I highly encourage you to consider running for the Representative Assembly so that you can represent the interests and beliefs of your state. A few years ago, AOTA put out statistics saying that on average, only 4% of AOTA members vote in AOTA elections. We need to make that change. So without further ado, let's go ahead and dive into these interviews. And I can't wait to hear your perspectives. Our next interview is with Dr. Michael Pizzi. He's a distinguished occupational therapist, holds the prestigious award for excellence in the advancement of occupational therapy, and was one of the youngest therapists to become fellow of the American Occupational Therapy Foundation. He pioneered the first childhood obesity occupation and client-centered assessment, which is currently undergoing psychometric testing and is used nationally. He is also the author of the valid and reliable Pizzi Health and Wellness Assessment, or PHWA, which has been used in the U.S. and abroad in OT curricula and in clinical settings. With over 60 peer-reviewed articles and chapters, he's a forerunner in areas such as HIV rehabilitation, childhood obesity, and health promotion. Dr. Pizzi co-edited two internationally used OT textbooks and is the founder of the Well Sounds Project, which showcases compositions inspired by OT interviews with children with special needs. He currently serves as a reviewer of the American, Canadian, and Australian OT journals and is a reviewer for OT in healthcare. Dr. Pizzi was also on the editorial board of Annals for the International Occupational Therapy and was an associate editor of the American Journal of Occupational Therapy, or AJOT. So without further ado, let's welcome Michael Pizzi. Well, welcome, Michael, to the Amplify OT podcast. I am so excited to have you here as part of our Individuals Running for President-Elect of AOTA series. And so welcome. And I'd love for you to tell our amplifiers a little bit about yourself and all the amazing things that you've done that we've been talking about. (laughs) Yes, we've had a wonderful conversation already. Um, Well, to launch right into the uh, candidacy piece, um, I think experience accounts for a lot. I've been an OT leader for nearly all of my 42 years of being an occupational therapist. Mm Um, with starting with my first AJOT article in 1984 on hospice care, um, I was 26 years old. So yeah. I was asked to write the article and I was beyond excited because I had just presented at AOTA on hospice and 400 people attended because it was a brand new innovative way of looking at um, occupational therapy and the application of occupation. 
and I was beyond excited. So 26 years old and all these <laughs> leaders of the profession were talking to me and I'm like, oh my gosh, who, who, what did I just do? It was, it was very exciting. Um, so I led the way uh, through developing innovative and fresh ideas and perspectives on where OT could be and where we could make a difference, including hospice and end of life care, HIV, AIDS, childhood obesity, and health and wellness. And the last three um, topics, I was actually privileged to be asked to be the guest editor of AJOT for. And I believe I'm the only occupational therapist that has guest edited three different topics. For yeah. Asia. So um, that that's that's pretty exciting. Um, a, a lot of people know me through my publications. I have over 60 peer reviewed articles, numerous book chapters, um, co-editor of two textbooks on health and well-being. I was one of the youngest OTs to get a fellow. Um when the political action committee was created, I was the on the first board, and I was on the first board of directors of AOTA, which is oh uh, wow, pretty cool. Yeah, yeah. Um, I've gotten lots of awards from AOTA for my service and leadership um, for various task groups, including the Recognition of Achievement Award, the Award of Excellence in the Advancement of OT, and two alumni awards. Um, now, besides all those. OT kinds of things <laughs> that that sort of promote my leadership and service. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm also a professional actor and, and singer. Um, I created a not-for-profit about 15 years ago called Touching Humanity, which is fully committed to putting uh, diversity, equity, inclusion, justice, accessibility, and belonging on the uh, in into action. Uh, our mission is to promote disability awareness and occupational and social justice through the arts and education. Um, so I was I was writing about and doing um, occupational justice kinds of things long before the definition of occupational justice yeah. was published. So I, I believe that I'm a pretty strong leader in, in those kinds of areas. Um, I also started a theater company and my theater company is in Pinehurst, North Carolina. Mm -hmm. And it is... Um, one where we do a lot of different, I create a lot of different shows and we donate um, some of the proceeds to the food bank because I think food insecurity is is yeah. a place where we need to help our communities more. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. I think it's such a, you know, we are connected on this of both having a musical background, but yeah, it's it's great to see the integration of OT in numeral, numerous different facets. And I know that's something that I talk about a lot, right? That OT is a skill set. It's not just what we do, but it's how we use those skills. And clearly you've applied those to many different facets of your interests, your occupational interests, as well as um, different areas of life. Yeah, it's it's such a privilege to, to help the community, but I get to do it through the arts, which is mm -hmm. something that I also have loved doing for since I was five years old, I've been singing. So <laughs> it, it, it's a, it's a real joy. Well, that's great. Yeah, I've been singing since I was five too, but no one wants to listen to me, you know? <laughs> well, I don't play the flute like you do, so... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's that's how I sing. No one wants to hear the actual voice. <laughs> well, perfect. So why are you running for AOTA president? So why why this moment and why president? I Like I said, I've been a leader in OT for over 40 years. Mm -hmm. and I thought this was a nice culmination to my career and, and a, a new beginning for me because I just left academia last August. So I don't have a full time job. I don't have a family to that I had to talk to and be responsible for all the time. So I have a lot of time. <laughs> and so I want to dedicate that to transforming how we see occupation and occupational therapy in the world. And I want to, in using your terms, I want to amplify OT throughout the country and throughout the world. And I don't think our, our public understands us still. And mm -hmm. I, I want to be able to change that. I have, uh, I think visibility and communication is what is often missing in our profession, which is yeah. which is so weird because we pride ourselves on, on communication skills, but I think that we don't communicate enough to our members and I want to change that as well. Um, I also want to make a, a strong point that last year's conference left me very concerned and upset about mm -hmm. the direction where we seem to be heading. There was such a lack of civility, dignity, and professionalism 
-hmm. with a protest and a call to boycott this year's conference. Um, I want to bring civility back, professionalism, and transparent communication to our organization through our membership. And I want to align all of the different groups that we have within our profession so that we're all talking the same talk and walking yeah. the same walk. Um, when some leaders call for boycotts and don't speak out about issues that tear us down, it's time for new leadership that promotes unity and collaboration and lifts us up. And I think that's where I'm, that's where I'm headed right now. So with that in line, you've kind of touched on these points already, but right, what would be your kind of day one priorities? If you could be like the American president and have executive decisions, what would be kind of the things that would be on your list of what you want to tackle right away? Right. Well, membership is number one yeah. um, because we are a membership driven profession. We do not communicate enough with our members. We not do not do enough with our members. We're not transparent enough with our members. And I think that all of that needs to change. And I think that might be, to answer a question you're gonna ask later, one yeah. of the driving forces that drives us, is driving members away, mm -hmm. is that they don't feel valued. And we need to value them and we need to make sure that they understand where their dollars are going and why they need to become a member. Um, we need to do better and provide first, better communication about that value. And second, find ways to provide members more for their money. Yeah. And I feel strongly about that. The second day, um, one priority <laughs> is to work with the board and others to increase our visibility mm. and show the general public our power and strength as an organization. Emails are just not sufficient for our members anymore. Right. We must show other kinds of actions. We must do more community outreach. We need to educate others to our value, going into marginalized communities for recruitment of more members mm -hmm. and educating about OT. That, that to me seems like, it seems so simple. And I think that I would call upon a lot of member volunteers to help me go out and, and make people more aware. Um, I've been advocating for uh, visibility for decades. I've been screaming about it. And, <laughs> and I got tired of always having to explain OT mm -hmm. um, and, and differenti differentiating us from other disciplines. I believe we still have a media arm to AOTA. And that's what I would, I would work hand in hand with them to see what else we can do. I know we have many papers and educational materials that we mm -hmm. can give out to people, uh, but we need to get it into the hands of our educators, our practitioners, and all these other people that yeah. uh, can help get the word out. Um, finally, <laughs> I, I, I'd really like to look at our vision and mission statements because I mm. think they need to be expanded and they need to be altered. Um, I don't think they're complete. Um, wow. and I, I, I really don't. Um, I think they, they sort of, um, they don't include a lot of issues that we're dealing with right now. And I, mm. I would like to, to change that. So I would do that in collaboration with membership. What do members think? about our vision and mission. And don't yeah. just make it a board activity, but let's get input from all people. Yeah. Right? And yeah. and I think we, we can do better with that. Are there any specific areas that you would want to see added that you think are missing currently? Well, I, I think the whole diversity, uh, equity, inclusion, justice, accessibility, and belonging issue needs to be addressed mm. in in a bigger way. Um, okay. It's really interesting. Our vision statement starts with as an as an inclusive profession. Well, I don't know if we're there yet. <laughs> but, um, I, and it, it's silly that we start with the phrase as an inclusive profession. Um, I don't think we need to say that. Mm -hmm. I think it's through our actions and through our other statements, uh, through our mission and vision statements, that we can actually demonstrate that we are an inclusive profession. So making yeah. sure we're walking the walk and talking the talk, right? Exactly. Exactly. I, I think we talk the talk too much mm -hmm. and um, we need to have demonstrable outcomes. Yeah. So what, and you've kind of touched on this as well, like what, in your opinion, do you think is the primary role or mission of AOTA within our profession? Yeah. So, so we have a mission statement to advance OT practice, education and research but I think that's very insufficient. It doesn't, mm -hmm. it doesn't really say much. Um, I think we must include advocacy, 
inclusivity and be much more specific about our mission so more members can understand where we stand and rally behind that mission. Um, if you ask uh, any number of OTs, including students, what our mission and vision statements are, I bet they have no idea. I'm not sure I could even tell you if I'm completely honest. <laughs> exactly. And, and I would like to, again, that needs to be out there more for all mm -hmm. of our members to understand and to take action around. And yeah. we, we don't do a great job of that right now. And I think that we can and should. Um, so, so our mission is also to be a unified voice for our clients mm -hmm. and not to be divisive among ourselves. I mean, division is not going to help us in any way, shape, or right. form. We have to all be on the same page. Yeah, I think there's a lot of a lot of different areas to heal and move forward. I think we've had a, quite a few rough years across the country, um, and it's nice to kind of you know hopefully we can find a unified way forward. Right, right. We need to collaborate more. We need to advocate for ourselves more and for each other more, mm -hmm. and not do some postings that tear other people down. That that's just unethical. It's unprofessional. It's irresponsible. And I think that we need to, we can be better and yeah. we can be more optimistic about our future. Great. So in your opinion, do you believe that membership is important or not? And why do you believe yeah. that? So I, I've been a proud member for over 40 years. Um, and my makes I have a great experience in, in leadership and scholarship and service to the profession. And I have loved being a member because I feel that being a member gives me a, gives me a sense of belonging mm. and it shows me that I can be included among professionals that respect and value what it is I do and what we do as a profession that changes the world. And we need to sort of show other people that we can do that. But we need more members so that we have more advocacy. Uh, people don't also understand that it's so important to be a member because it helps us with our political action committee and it helps us to be more politically onboarding in Congress and, and with our politicians on, on a state and federal level. And we need to really get the word out. But sometimes that takes dollars. And yeah. people need to understand that those dollars is what can help us uh, continue our licensure, uh, help us with regulatory practices, help us to get OT more visible and, and paid for through mm -hmm. third party payers. And I think that we, um, we need to advocate more for ourselves. I'd also like to figure out a way with the board and with our members how to um, maintain membership for all those students. So we need to figure out a way to, uh, to make that happen. And, and that's, that's a, a priority of mine. And so why have you been a member of AOTA over these last 40 years? What has kind of kept you committed and why are you still a member? Well, just just being a part of of the organization and the profession, it, it has, it has provided me a, an identity that um, is is important to me. A lot of people, maybe they they have left um, to because they don't feel a professional identity. They, they don't feel a sense of belonging. Mm -hmm. Well, I'd like to uncover the reasons why. Um, I think it's I think it's vital. I also have recognized being part of the uh, political action committee myself and having donated over the many years that. I that that's where we also need to be politically. We need to work with our Congress people so that they understand yeah. what it is we do and why we do it and help them to get bills passed that will help us as a profession. But when it helps us, it helps all of our clients. Mm -hmm. And sometimes we lose sight of that. So yeah. your membership actually helps your clients their families mm -hmm. and, and and helps um, you develop a professional identity. Yeah, so I'm hearing those overall themes of community and advocacy. Is that fair um, to summarize that up? Absolutely, absolutely. It, it, it's a sense of belonging. Yes, uh, which which we all um, aspire to, because we can't do this alone. We yeah. we just can't. Um, members cannot depend on the board and. Uh, on the board to do everything perfectly either. I mean, there are sometimes people will make mistakes 
Right. And <laughs> I think a sense of forgiveness mm -hmm. and understanding and kindness needs to come back to our profession. Mm -hmm. Um, we do not want to reflect what's going on in society right now. We do want to reflect goodness and, and, and that compassion. And that's why I, I believe that I would bring compassionate leadership to um, the fore. I like that term, compassionate leadership. That's yeah, great. yeah. So in our last workforce study, and you touched on this, it showed that 25% right, of practitioners are considering leaving the field of OT. Yeah. And- AOTA had a 7% drop in membership this past year. So how or do you think these issues are related? And what do you think is the best way to address these issues within our workforce and within our profession? Well, one, one of the things that I think we need to aspire to and cultivate is a culture of cultural humility. Mm. I think that we need to have more respect for each other and with each other. Because if we don't have that respect, then people are going to say, why should I belong to this organization? Right. Um, that's one thing. I think the other thing is visibility. I think a lot of OTs are tired of having to define themselves and right. tell people what it is we do and how we do it. Now, I love it. I love defining <laughs> occupation for people. I love explaining what it is I do and how I do it. I put everything in the context of promoting health, well-being, and quality of life, because I think we're missing the boat on that too. Mm. Um, and I I believe that it's it's a matter of being more public, uh, making making the public more aware of who we are and what we do and showing them the value of what we do. And it's yeah. not just through scholarship. I mean, our scholars do that really well. Mm -hmm. I think every member needs to say, you know, I had a patient the other day, blah, 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 blah. And this, <laughs> this is where they, what they presented to me. And this is the outcome. And it's because of occupational therapy that they're living a quality of life now. Yeah. Those are the kinds of stories, those clinical stories that we need to put out there in the world. My new textbook, Interprofessional Perspectives for Community Practice, Promoting Health, Well-Being, and Quality of Life is coming out shortly, hopefully in the next Congratulations. month. Congratulations. So. <laughs> and in there, I developed um, two very important chapters. One is totally on um, diversity, equity, and inclusion. The second is clinical stories. And I asked clinicians from all over the country to write a short two, three-page story about how they are engaging people towards promoting um, health, well-being, and quality of life from a community perspective, oh. from an interprofessional perspective. And the stories have been amazing, yeah. but it's now a chapter in the book. So instead of like a case study, which mm -hmm. is in all of our chapters, we have a whole chapter dedicated to just stories. And I think our academics can teach those stories to our students and say, that's the value of occupational therapy. Yeah. So that not only that advocacy at that higher level, right, the national level, but also that individual advocacy of speaking up for yourself and for your, the profession yes. at that local level. Absolutely. And it shows care and concern and compassion and kindness um, through those stories, which is something we forget to talk about. Mm -hmm. And I think it's important that we talk about those kinds of issues. Yeah. So yeah. what advice would you give to someone who's interested in volunteering or taking on a leadership role? Yeah, I, I love that question. Um, so first of all, be committed fully to your profession and to the clients you serve. Be committed. If you can't walk the walk and you're just talking the talk, you shouldn't be a volunteer leader. Mm -hmm. So I think it's important that you walk the walk as well. Um, you want to make a difference for and within your profession. What kind of a difference can you make having your voice heard? And it shouldn't be a single agenda. It should be looking at the broader issues that are presented to us. So um, I, I think those are the, the three things that I would um, recommend to potential volunteer leaders. 
Yeah, I think there's always either there's hesitancy, right, where we don't feel like we know enough or we're not prepared yeah. to be a leader. And that's always a difficult thing to overcome. But I think it's the kind of the doing the work perspective of you know, making sure that we're actually involved in what it is that we want to do. And I think all of us who have found ourselves in leadership positions, right, it's because we've seen something we didn't like and we want to change it. And so who's going to do it? And you volunteer yourself, right? I think that's kind of this, the the age old story of leadership is seeing something you wouldn't like and wanting to make a difference. Exactly. And, and a lot of people, I, I liked how you touched on people think they don't have the skills or the experience. Mm -hmm. if, if you think you have skills and experience that can forward the profession and forward AOTA, then you should definitely be a volunteer leader. Because even if you think you're you're too shy or too embarrassed or too not too confident, you might have the skills and then develop that sense of confidence by being demonstrating your competence. Mm -hmm. and I think that that's, that translates really well. So I would encourage anyone with certain skills that can forward our profession to volunteer. I'm a big advocate for people volunteering. I think that's something you and I share of getting involved very early in very our early. careers. Very early. And and having people that empower you. Mm -hmm. Yes. That empower you. I, I think that that's really, really important. Yeah. My mentors have made a huge difference in getting me to where I am and having that circle. And so having someone who makes you, who pumps you up is always really, really helpful. Oh, definitely. Definitely. I've, I've had a wonderful mentor named Ellen Kolodner mm -hmm. since um, I became an OT, <laughs> uh, just a short few years after yeah. that. And she has given me some wonderful advice over the years that helps to help to shape and, and guide my career for all these years. And I think bringing that back again, right to that community piece. Absolutely. So the final question to sum up why, the big question, why should someone vote for Michael Pizzi? Which I should mention, I loved your little slogan, right? Of It's easy, vote for Pizzi. I thought that was very clever. <laughs> it's easy, just vote for Pizzi. Remember that, folks. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Well, first of all, um, I've been a leader for many years, as we've been talking about, and a strong advocate for the mm -hmm. profession through my leadership, my service, and through scholarship. So um, I think if anybody knows me, that they might know me through my scholarship work. They might know me through my many task forces that I've been on, the awards that I've won, et cetera. Um, but all those things don't matter when, uh, um, except when it translates into using those and using mm -hmm. all of my skills that I've learned over the years to become a strong leader. I can reach across many differences, listen and hear issues and see beyond those issues in ways and in developing ways that we can all work together. I think we um, there's a lot of division right now in our profession. Yeah. And I'd like to be, um, so one of the things that I am is a unifier and a collaborator. I, I listen to all the voices. Um, as, as a person of a marginalized community, I'm a, I'm a gay man for many, many years. Well, <laughs> for many, many years. <laughs> um, yes, I've been gay for many, many years. Um, we could probably edit that a little bit. Um, <laughs> I think it's good. I think it's good. <laughs> um, I, I know what it's like to be marginalized and mm -hmm. I know like to be bullied and, and, and um, be feel less than. And so it's important. So I can absolutely recognize the the need to be as inclusive as we possibly can. Um, I finally, I'm, I'm an innovator. And I see where occupational therapy can go not just mm -hmm. where we are, and where we've been. Uh, it's been evident in my scholarship, in my lectures all over the world, um, and my keynotes that I've been so blessed to have have given. Um, but I want to end with a quick story. Yes. In 1985, when I was 27 years old and four years practicing, <clears throat> I used the principle of hospice care where the family is the unit of care. Mm -hmm. and created the social environment questionnaire because I believed we needed to include the family in some of our occupational therapy treatment plans. This was 1985. 
Um, I presented to hundreds of OTs at an AOTA conference. And one person asked how they would get paid for that. Right. My response was that sometimes you just do things out of care and concern for others. Uh, that got great applause. Mm -hmm. And afterwards, the great Wilma West looked to looked for me and said, quote, keep going. You're on to something with how forward thinking you are. Mm -hmm. And I carried that one interaction with me my entire career. Because if Wilma West said it, then it must be true. I have been so blessed to, to do so many things in our profession. And I see this as another avenue to continue that mission, um, to forward the profession. I love that story. And I think that's even a good summary of occupational therapy, where we don't always realize how those one moment interactions can change and influence someone's life. And I think that's, for me, one of the most rewarding parts of being an occupational therapy practitioner is those little moments that can change the tra trajectory of someone's life. Especially coming from a leader in our profession, mm -hmm. uh, when they pull you aside and they tell you these remarkable things, you have to believe them. And you go, <laughs> right. Well, I guess I'm on the right track. I think I should keep doing that. And that what, like I said, that one interaction almost 40 years ago mm -hmm. changed the entire trajectory of my career. So um, I, I feel very, very lucky to have known many, many amazing leaders in, in my 42 years of being an OT. And I hope that I would be a good role model for people uh, as a leader in our profession. Well, excellent. Well, thank you so much, Michael, for coming on the podcast, answering my questions. I'm sure you agree with this, that everyone should go vote and participate in this year's election. Please. Um, it's exciting to see the competition, I think. And so yeah. I just I just want to thank you for, for being here and giving uh, members and the general community as a whole the opportunity to hear from you and your perspectives. Well, you are doing wonderful work, Clarice, and, and keep going yourself. Thank you. I will carry that with me. <laughs> hey, I'm Clarice, and I'm the founder of Amplify OT. And thank you so much for either watching this video or listening to the Amplify OT podcast. If you haven't already, I strongly encourage you to listen to all the different interviews. And of course, I encourage you to join our Amplifiers community at learn.amplifyot.com in order to continue this important conversation. You can now join the Amplify OT membership for free, or we have our full access passes. I have the link in the description for you, or you can go to learn.amplifyot.com. You can also join our community by downloading the Amplify OT app now available on iOS devices. Our mission at Amplify OT is to make learning about policy easy so that you can engage in advocacy. And a key part of advocacy is voting. So I sincerely hope you participate in this year's AOTA elections. Voting opens on February 2nd, 2024 and closes on February 23rd at 11.59 a.m. Eastern Time. And as a reminder, you must be a member of AOTA as of January 2nd in order to vote. And you must also be an active member at the time that you cast your vote. So thank you again to all the candidates for participating in this project. It is so exciting to see this level of energy around this election. And of course, I hope you come back to Amplify OT to learn more about Medicare, billing, policy, and advocacy so that you can be the change that you want to see in our healthcare system and within our profession. Thanks so much again for watching and don't forget to share this video so that others can hear what the candidates have to say. And of course, make sure to subscribe to the Amplify OT podcast on your favorite podcast app. Remember, if you don't advocate for occupational therapy, who will? <laughs>